Hi, everyone. This is our monthly interview feature. So we're really happy this month actually to be able to bring you the incredible Antoine Zufour from Montreal, Quebec. Let's welcome Antoine to our little thing. Let's see if I can figure out the software again. OK, there he is, all the way from Montreal, Quebec. Hey. Antoine Zufour, how you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me today. It's fun to uh, be here. Yeah. Uh, able to be here for uh, talk with you, man. Bienvenue, mon ami. Uh, so uh, it's really great to have Antoine here. It's been a, a long time dream of mine to get him on here because uh, I'm a huge fan. And uh, um, <laughs> uh, Antoine, Antoine, uh, it's kind of funny. I'm sure he'll tell you more about this. But many years ago, I uh, got a couple of emails from him back in the, uh, sort of around the same time. I was starting to hear a little bit from uh, Andy McKee. Uh, same era, I guess, whenever that was. And early, uh, yeah. early 2000s, okay, so about 20 years ago. And um, it was so cute because uh, I guess you were probably a, a CEGEP student or something at the time. And um, I wrote I wrote you back and I just was, you know, chatting or whatever. And then you were like, this isn't really Don Ross writing me back. <laughs> I got such a kick out of that. And I was like, well, yeah, I, I don't have any people. It's me. <laughs> anyway, <Yep. laughs> it's great. And um, then I think the first time we really got to hang out was uh, at the Festival uh, Mémoire et Racine or something up in Neur Juliette one summer. I seem to remember. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. True. yeah, yeah that's, so there's a... Uh, yeah, probably thousand and... I'd say, I don't know, five or something. It's or a long time ago, yeah. Before that. I'm not the, sure. Just to explain, there's this uh, really great festival that happens in the area of Quebec where uh, Antoine actually grew up. And uh, it's near a town called Joliette. So it's sort of up the river from Montreal, further north and east. And uh, there's uh, this, it's really a traditional music um, festival. And it uh, specializes a lot in traditional Quebec music. And so it's really cool. But then they bring in um, interesting players like Harry Manx was there. And, uh, you know, he does his weird sort of crossover East-West Indian blues stuff. And uh, uh, they had me. And uh, did you actually play at the festival that year, Antoine? Yeah, I remember we had like, uh, I, I did actually uh, some workshops also. Uh, That's with right. You guys and uh, one one big show on the big stage with uh, all of us kind of doing That's round right. things. That's right. It's yeah, all coming back now. It was fun to, to be with, with you, for the, you know, on the stage there with kind of a a dream happening. <laughs> like crazy stuff, you know, and that was, I mean, you know, uh, that was, uh, I was, so blown away by your music and uh, it's like you've been my inspiration you know and especially when i was starting my career right there it's like it was like a big moment and it was so much fun Can well I that's remember? great yeah, that's yeah. Great. well it's <laughs> lovely to hear and uh then you know i could tell from the early points of hearing your music for the very first time i thought uh wow this guy really knows this shit, you know <laughs> and, and it's it's really interesting because um I think you're you're one of the few players that I've really gotten to know that um, has a really great background in every element. I mean, um, you're obviously a very highly skilled player, and you've put a lot of time into that. But also, your your understanding of music is really high, and also your uh, and you know the theory and harmony behind it. And also, you're an incredible recording engineer and uh, a mastering engineer, and you've studied all that stuff as well. So you know all the technical side of how to make a record really well, and uh, and your videos are beautiful to watch and listen to. So um, I really admire the fact that you haven't been afraid to just go ahead and uh, you know tackle everything and get get good at it all and, and be able to create a cohesive art piece that really says what you want to say and uh, a lot of respect for that that's wow, wonderful thank you very much wow thanks <laughs> well i'm not the only one who thinks that way a lot of people talk about you behind your back you know <laughs> but the, but they don't they don't say anything but good things <laughs> well whatever but yeah thanks that's awesome thank you <laughs> so um maybe tell us a little bit about your background about uh growing up in Quebec and learning about music and uh, where that all started for you that would I'm sure everybody would love to hear that yeah sure um well I started playing guitar I was 15 years old so uh, because I, I really started listening to music I was about 14 you know uh, getting in the teens and uh, starting to get interest in in music a little more and then um, um, I, I was mostly hearing music from my 
my what my dad would play uh, with his vinyls and the treble sound systems at home and uh, I would hear uh, a lot of Genesis and Yes and, uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, Gentle Giant and um, all that great stuff that you know as well. And um, that's kind of how I got interested in music. And then I, I asked my father to, because he was kind of, you know, just strumming a little bit and playing some some stuff with, uh, he had a 12 string. Uh, actually, I still have it, but it's... Uh, <laughs> almost destroyed <laughs> uh, the action is that high you know the bridge like this you know? yeah that's a, <laughs> sort of the, the fate of a lot of 12 string guitars you know? yeah yeah <laughs> Mormon 12 string guitars is what happened <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's just an impossible structure anyways but um yeah that that's uh, that was fun though i could like start but my my mom had a, a, a nylon string what i still i still have it's a, an ovation nylon string and that's on on the that's the instrument i started really learning stuff and my dad showed me a few chords like there's this uh this song you know one of my first tunes i learned is uh this song by uh, uh what's their name anyways the you know la, in, in quebec la poupée qui fait non Dun, 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 sure, sure. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> D A E. So that's uh, that was like the first stuff, you know. And then he showed me a couple of things and the bar chords, and and eventually um, I wanted to, you know, I was just very curious about when I heard uh, mostly by listening to Yes, um, when I I heard uh, Mood for a Day from Steve Howe. That's like the, the song that, that really started me up on playing with my fingers. Um, so I was getting interested in uh, what's, how do you play that? It's like, wow, there's one guitar and all that stuff. So um, I had like a big book of yes songs and it, the notes were in there, you know, like the piano versions of it, like arrangements of piano with lyrics and stuff. So it, there was this, this uh, it was in the book, but it's just as notes. So I started really figuring, trying to figure it out and um, learning by my own. And eventually, uh, I got away with it, and I was able to kind of follow on the, on this, on the the music, and be able to play along. And I was like, "Yeah, that's cool." So I was playing that in the high school, and people were like, "Wow, that's cool!" and stuff. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, play with the fingers like that crazy stuff. Uh, I was by the time just playing with my thumb and index finger, like you know, Merle Travis two, style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just playing all the scales with one finger. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> anyways. Um, so that brought me uh, into, uh, you know, just after uh, when I was ending my high school and um, I was 17. And, you know, it's the time that you have to kind of choose where what you're going to do in college and all that. So I um, I was getting really interested in music. So I started um, I wanted to uh, to to go into um, classical guitar. But um, I did a kind of a double. Um, uh, we have a DEC here at uh, the college degree, which is normally a two years to prepare for university. But there's those um, those uh, programs that are over three years, and it's like two programs in one. And then uh, I did some uh, pure sciences and music program in over three years. So that's kind of what I did in college. And uh, that's where I got my really first uh, guitar lessons with my classical guitar teacher uh, there, Claude Pépin, which is, lives in Joliet, uh, pretty close to where the festival you were talking about. Uh, that's where I went to college in Joliet. So um, he, he was really open mind and he, um, you know, that's where I got my first real guitar lessons. And then after, um, you know, after learning some basic stuff, he, he, he was really open mind and he, he gave me... He, um, he actually uh, made me listen to uh, Leo Kotke, uh, Pierre Ben Susan, um, and uh, Michael Hedges, and of course yourself. And he had like this uh, copied, <laughs> copied cassette of your uh, Bearing Straight album. So it was <laughs> like, a, yeah, that, that was a cassette with like a, you know, <laughs> copied. I don't know how he got it, but he led it to me. And I was listening to that. I was like so blown away. It was like, what? What's going on? How how can you have like a vibrato on open strings and all that stuff? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the the neck thing I couldn't see right right just before uh, any YouTube or anything like that. It was in like about uh, ninety eight or something, mm -hmm. ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine, and um, so I wanted to really you know um, demystify that and learn that stuff. So. Um, and by the way, this album is like amazing to me. It's a, such a great album. It's oh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and it's very inspiring. And um, 
that's uh that, that's how I got into fingerstyle a little more. I learned like maybe twenty of your tunes, so I guess that's uh, <laughs> wow. Very uh, that really uh, got me to learn a lot of the the techniques, uh, you know, from from classical to uh, to fingerstyle and to learn those extended stuff, the harmonic slaps, the harmonics with one hand and, and the uh, tapping and all that stuff, or uh, you know, the percussive hits and uh, you know different things. So I really uh, I really dig your stuff and I got into it and got involved in learning that a lot and playing and recording those songs. Um, so that's that's really how I I really started to 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 get somewhere in the in the fingerstyle uh, music, and uh, eventually uh, after that I I went to college a different place for in sound engineering in Drummondville, where um that's where I got uh, m more like in, into the sound engineering stuff. But uh, I also uh, made some good uh, good friends there. Uh, Sébastien Cloutier and uh, David Robert. Well, David Robert actually played a track on my uh, last record too, uh, Spiritual Groove with like the Cajon on it. Um, and back in the days of my first uh, record, I just got it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he played also the drums on there, and um, it's and then we recorded that first album at, at Sébastien Cloutier's uh, studio. That's uh, one of my friends I, I've I've um, met at this college, and then you know he. He was already in sound engineering, and he was a uh, he was advanced. So he really helped me, and we recorded that album. And he, I I mixed it with him too, and I learned a lot of tricks. And we tried many things to to get the sound a certain place. You know, we were exploring, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot. And from there, after um, you know, kept kept doing. Uh, that's basically I wrote this album in two thousand and four, uh, two thousand. 2003 and released it the first time in 2004 and then uh, after uh after that in 2005 i got to compete at the canadian guitar festival so that's it's kind of the next step i guess and then i you know that's that, that was that was fun to meet a lot of players uh, to uh um just to to get experience with other other, other players like andy mckee actually that i i met there um I saw him before that. I never met him before, but I've 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 kind of saw him at uh, in Winfield actually. Just to go back in time a little bit, in 2002, I did go to uh, Winfield with my parents. I did the trip to uh, to Winfield, you know. Oh wow! Yeah, well, it was a little uh, uh, a little trailer camp thing, and um, we went uh, we went to there, and then I competed. I've 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 met there uh, actually a, a bunch of people like. Uh, Stephen Bennett, um, uh, I've seen uh, Tommy Manuel play. I've seen, uh, of course, Stephen Bennett play. I've seen uh, Pat Donahue um, and Andy. I saw Andy play there at the competition, and then I I saw him uh, also after that play a song with somebody else. It was kind of cool. And um, so, I, oh yeah, and I've met uh, Don Alder too there. The first time he was uh, he was there, and then I got to meet him in 2002, and uh, that's fun. So I, I started like building a you know, getting into the circles of fingerstyle guitar, you know, learning who is in there and the, uh, the players and listening to new music. You know, I remember from coming from uh, from that uh, Winfield first trip that was like I bought like so many albums of Stephen Bennett, all the harp guitar stuff and all the sure. This is like mind blowing. Um, I love his music a lot too. He's like such a great um, melody uh, writer. I yeah, love he's, his a, he's a very lyrical writer. Oh, at what point did you start writing a lot of music yourself, like uh, especially guitar music? Yeah, that's good. Right on 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 the on the that trip right there. So that's I I started writing uh, stuff a little bit before, maybe one or two songs I wrote like in two thousand. You know, just my first very first stuff, but. Um, I really started writing a little more between, I guess, 2002, 2003, and uh, because of this competition. So I wrote maybe, uh, I think I wrote like four four little tunes that I went for competing. And then when I came back, I kept writing more stuff. I got inspired a lot by listening to those those players. So um, I've got like, I wrote like uh, all my songs for this Nessance record 
uh, pretty much on the way back of Winfield, I guess. And uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not 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 only that, but after you know the, the the weeks and months after that, but I was so inspired that I wrote a lot of stuff. And then after that, a uh, year after, started recording. And then I, to come back where I was earlier, I went to um, the Canadian Guitar Festival in 2005, and that's when uh, I got second place. And uh, it was Eric Turnbull won this year, and, yeah, yeah. And, and he got third. Yeah, that was great great experience it was a lot of fun got to meet you uh, there too uh, again meet a, a bunch of players it was a lot, very uh, uh very fun experience and uh, a lot of i i took a lot out, out of it and especially that um i got a call from uh, rob poland after that yeah that was my next question uh, uh, what was your um history with getting involved with candy rat it's right there. So uh, after my first record, the first competition got, uh, when I got second place at at, um, at a Canadian Guitar Festival, I go to uh, I go home and then I got this call back a month maybe later from Rob saying, oh, uh, you know, I'm starting this label with Don Ross and uh, with a few artists and stuff. And uh, I'm really interested in your music. I saw you compete and I got your albums. I love it. I'd like to, you know, have it on the on the on the label so it was like a good opportunity it was awesome so um we released that album in a, a year later so i had it kind of done on myself but in the next year the label took it so uh, that's why it's like a 2005 release but i i actually it was released a year before that and then um that's you know from there i started doing a little more uh shows uh, like opening for you i remember doing a tour uh, with you uh, and we did some opens, uh, you know, with uh, Eric and uh, Andy, uh, following you in the Midwest uh, and stuff like that. Oh right, uh, that was that was those. Uh, didn't we play in like St. Louis and? Yeah, uh, I remember that place, one yeah. especially. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and all that. Yeah, in St. Louis. Yeah, <laughs> that was a fun tour. So that that's you know, started the wheel a little bit, and then uh, I'm, I mean, and as you know, after maybe in 2006. Um, I, uh, you, I think you did too, some, rec some video recordings for YouTube. I did too. And then Andy did also, and we all like put it out on, on YouTube because YouTube was really starting in 2006. Yeah. It was brand and, new. Yeah. And starting to kind of lift off. And, uh, and that's when Andy got like featured on the first page and stuff. And like, yeah, the label entirely just took a different yeah, dimension. Um, and, yeah, and, the, and the, the impression I got at that time too, is that, um, uh, of all the other artists on the label, uh, it felt like your particular presence, um, it, se it seemed to get the best benefit of the association with Andy on the label. Like it seemed like a lot of his success spilled. I mean, it spilled over into all of us because we would come up as related videos on the side of the page, yeah. but, um, your videos seemed to take off really well after that. Yeah, so um, basically, I had uh, recorded my second record development. <laughs> <laughs> All my products, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's when I did those videos. Was right after the second album I recorded, like in my bedroom and my parents, and uh, you know that was tough. But anyways, it was really hot in there. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so we put it out on, on uh, YouTube and then in early 2000, because it, that happens really late in December, I think, uh, 2006. And that really put help, helped me to, to get on the map. Uh, and then I, I was recording my next one in um, 2007. So that and then released it in 2008, like the existence album. And uh, this one really got well uh, received i think that really helped me so after that momentum build up a little bit with andy and doing a little more touring with him and other players also with craig d'andrea and uh, uh with uh, again opening with you and other players and you know got, getting momentum and putting out more stuff on youtube it kind of kept the wheel turning and with this uh, existence album it really helped me to kind of establish a good a good fan base i guess from there and then you know, from now on, I just started building up on it, and you know, built my my career, I guess, on uh, on yeah. this uh, these pretty much these three first albums. Um, and I got I got the first place also, I think, in the the next year in two thousand and six. In the yeah, that yeah, doesn't so hurt. In, yeah, and that, that, that doesn't <laughs> hurt at all. Festival, so that really helped. Yep. So all that you know together really helped to get the wheel 
turning and stuff going. So. Cool. Going to fast forward a little tiny bit. Um, you put out uh, a record uh, a few years ago. I can never remember the names of all the records, but the, right. the, the, the double album that you did where you did like an acoustic version of all the tunes and then electronic versions of all the tunes. Yeah, the, yeah. this one. Yeah. 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 What's it called forth. again, that album? Back and Forth. Back and Forth, that's it. Um, and yeah, and it, uh, I know I'm sort of skipping all over the place chronolo right. chronologically, but um, Back and Forth for me was a really interesting project because uh, first of all, you did a lot of crowdfunding for it, which, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's a model that, can be successful and uh some people have done really well with it it can also be very frustrating it really depends um but it seems like you were successful with it and um your plan was to put it out on cd as well as lp and mm -hmm. it, everything was double you know because of this this crazy concept you had of coming up with uh, solo guitar versions of tunes and then also doing them electronically and i know that at the same time i remember we talked during that time a lot you were you had this like electronic was it a trio that you did yeah, uh, yeah you did a lot of uh electronic music at the same time so that's an interesting i mean in a way it's not that surprising given the fact that uh so many people are inspired by gaming music and stuff like that but what what where did you come to electronic music from what, what was your what what brought you into that and why did you decide to make a project that employed both that's really interesting uh, yeah, I guess um, it, it's just um, it happens slowly because I started getting in, interested in um, more like electronic stuff a little bit. I'm not like I don't know much about electronic stuff, to be honest. It's just like using keyboards a little bit and samples and stuff. But as far as a synth, uh, I'm not like a keyboard player at all. So anyways, but I can program stuff. But my uh, I, I have a good friend, uh, Dominic Berard, which is on uh, also played the bass on the last record. Um uh, that started to get some um, um, some fun stuff going, composing with that, and this we we were sending back and forth. To, <laughs> same title, but we were <laughs> sending stuff and then riffs that we wrote and ideas, and we started like working on songs together. And uh, I got my cousin to 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 you know to sing some some stuff on it. So we 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 kind of worked over years, like maybe from. Uh, 2010 or something uh, to um, up until now um slowly on a couple of riffs couple of ideas and i was exploring a lot of uh, of that 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 kind of music or you know the production side of it and i got a lot of fun because it's it's very different it's it brings me more to a composition or more of a um kind of um you don't because you don't have to perform it it, it kind of frees you from uh, having to practice so much to achieve ideas right which is a, a hard thing on guitars you have to put a lot of a lot of um uh elbow uh oil uh, did you say that that uh, <laughs> elbow elbow grease well elbow. yeah elbow grease uh, into playing and learning uh, the songs and be able to perform but uh it, there's something liberating i guess from writing electronic stuff that the you let the computer do the, the you know the the performance so you can it's just the imagination of finding sounds and arrangements and trying stuff out and messing with sound and so that's that's a kind of a different approach and i kind of really enjoyed doing that and i, I got you know more and more better at doing it and and slowly by doing that i felt like what if i i would do a project which i could actually translate some of the some of my songs into this format just to just to show maybe that there's a possible that a song is not necessarily tied to an instrument, but uh, it could be trans. If it's a song, if it's a good song, I think it, you can translate it in different, many different ways, many different aesthetics. So that's that's kind of um, because I was exploring that and I was also playing guitar. I decided to do this kind of fusion between the two and try to try this crazy project of you know just translating all my solo guitar tunes into electronic songs in a, in a certain way i mean so that was a lot of fun that was a what i did mostly is recording the acoustic songs use them as a template and i would go into a midi uh, a different a different session and then start like uh, you know translating the bass part on a sound for now and say piano or synth sound and and do the chords and then add the beats and then uh, pick up the melody, play it on a different instrument, and then find sounds you know, after a little bit of time trying to work on different sounds. Like, find, let's find a 
an overall direction I want in this song. So I have maybe a piano sound there, maybe a, this kind of Moog sound here, maybe this. And, you know, uh, with time building it up and, you know, making making it sound differently. But I have the acoustic song going like in parallel. So I could always refer to it, but I'll, I could also use some elements of it and sample it if you want and sure. bring it in, into the, the, you know, modify it and kind of melt it together. But if, and that, that just, just on a side note, if, if one would, would do that, it, it, you could, over, you could uh, use the acoustic tracks and the electronic tracks and put them together. They will play in sync. Um, <laughs> yeah. One so song, it's, like, it's really yeah. interesting. It's really interesting that you work like that because, um, you know, as you probably know, I've been uh, doing a lot of orchestration and, uh, orchestration very often can work the same way. I mean, you, uh, very often if, if I'm f scoring a film, I'll sit with my, my, I've got my MIDI keyboard right here, uh, right where you can't see it. But, um, es essentially, yeah, essentially, um, I might watch the screen and then improvise something on the piano sound, you know, just get a piano sound on, on my yeah. MIDI controller and then if i like the theme i've got then i can either just grab the piano sound and put it in the strings and then and then mm -hmm. reorchestrate it so that it sounds more natural you know or i can put it in horns or i can i can take little bits of it and so it sounds like you were doing the same thing but with an actual you know like yeah. an analog sound so that that's kind of fascinating I I've, that, I, sorry go ahead no but yeah but also what i was doing is sometimes taking the midi files from my tablature and oh. uh, using that and then translating sometimes it to get the notes in. But it's sometimes a very complex thing because you have all the parts together. So you have to select like the bass. Yeah, note exactly. And exactly. then copy it on a separate track. So I would sometimes do that as well if it was uh, easy. And, and sometimes what happens is some crazy stuff because you, you, you have like a certain patterns together. You put it on a different a monophonic sound and it creates this kind of crazy part. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then you find like a, a way to make it like sound certain ways and so you sometimes accidentally you find like those ideas are kind of oh, wow well, what if i put this sound like you say you 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 switch it you change track you put it at strings or this kind of synth or that and then you get like a, a cool thing happening it's like wow almost by mistake but you know that's yeah okay. well that's, that's the that's, that's the wonderful thing about it, um doing like sort of orchestration yeah. experimentation where you try uh, combining different sounds, uh, playing the same line, for example, mm -hmm. and then the the two together ends up sounding like neither of the other. You know, it's the same thing with with uh, acoustic instruments. When you take really good s orchestral samples and you hear a flute part, and you try it in the oboe, and neither of them is maybe what you want, but you hear the two of them together, and people jokingly call it a flobo, and <laughs> and f that flobo sound, it's really cool because it sounds kind of like a bigger fatter flute sound it's it's hard to explain yeah. it any other way so it's really cool what you discover yeah that's that's why that's so interesting that's there's so much possibilities you can do with the computer with like those in your daw and uh, programming stuff that's you know that for any musician that loves music it's just like a, a good uh you know uh, i would say a sand a sandbox for kids like exactly that. yeah. exactly so that, yeah that's like uh, that's like that you have all your 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 stuff and your your shovels and then you, <laughs> <laughs> you just play with that stuff around it's like yay well i i had i had only dabbled a little bit in midi um over the past 10 15 years on my albums i would play a piano part mm -hmm. in, in, through midi and uh edit it and stuff like that or i would uh add some string parts or you know just little little minor things here and there actually studying it big time really made me realize what a valuable tool uh, mm -hmm. midi and midi editing is i think a lot of um acoustic musicians shy away from it because it feels like a whole different world which it kind of is but also yeah. it's it's all music you know and so if you mm -hmm. can use it all to make music that's great i have some questions from uh, and comments from some of our um oh, cool group members. So uh, just to explain, we have a, uh, I have this little online guitar academy and then um, people have, a, a part of what they can do is they can join a private Facebook group and we meet every week. And uh, usually I, I sit and talk about different aspects of music and once a month we have a special guest like yourself. And uh, so people have some questions for you. Uh, Ryan in the US, he says, uh, he noticed that you have a zero fret on your guitar. And he says, I've, ah. been see I've been seeing this a lot lately. He says, what are the pros and cons? And, um, and we, we, have, we have not addressed this before, Ryan, so it's an interesting mm -hmm. question. 
So can, can you can you explain first what a zero fret is, just in case people don't? Yeah, know what normally it is. a zero fret normally is like a, instead of the nut, you have a fret there. The strings will will just go directly from a fret at the zero nut point. But I actually I don't I don't have a zero fret. It's just because the design of uh, of Mario's guitars from far you it seems like it because there's a line here that's like a over line uh, how would you say that anyways a kind of a uh, inlay a like an like an inlay, inlay around the yeah. whole thing yeah and then you I'm, i'll try to show you so it's just decorative it's not yeah. it's not it's not it's practical not a fret. it's just like a line under yeah it's not a fret so yeah that's interesting because the zero fret idea I really associate with like guitars yeah. from many years ago. Like uh, yeah. it was uh, something you used to see a lot uh, on guitars from a certain era. But also I think that maybe the advantage of a zero fret is if you if you want the sound of steel strings over a piece of steel. Um, mm -hmm. For example, uh, I have a guitar. Actually, it's a guitar that lives in Montreal now. My daughter has it. Um, but it's a it's a Loudon guitar that I bought uh, when I was a university student uh, 377 years ago and um, <laughs> so it's a it's a beautiful Loudon guitar and uh, I went to see Michael Hedges <coughs> excuse me and the thing I really noticed about his sound of his open strings was really special like they rang a certain way and then I saw that he had taken um, a, a brass nut and put it in the place of the bone one on his guitar and uh, so a friend of mine did that. And a friend of mine in Toronto would um, actually could take a, a brass blank like that and then notch in the, the string notches and replace the nut with it with a piece of metal. And then you get metal on metal and you get this different kind of ring that you would from uh, metal on bone. So that's one of the reasons why some, some guitars have a zero fret, I think. But yeah, who knows? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I've played the uh, zero for a long time ago, but uh, yeah, that's I don't know. It's uh, probably it's good for I would assume that it's good also for bending if you bend behind the knot or do a lot of bending stuff because it might be less like stuck in the you know the, the strings may be more free like on bearing or something that would be similar to to you know to to be able to bend without losing the tuning too much i don't know i would i would assume that i'm not sure <laughs> sure yeah <there's laughs> all kinds of weird reasons for it i'm sure Kerstin in germany she says uh, i remember all these early antoine videos on youtube where he was wearing dream theater t-shirts and yep. and, I, and she says and the, i i was a huge dream theater fan at that time and got a kick out of that since the acoustic guitar music is quite different although it's funny casting how many people like at least two very prominent acoustic guitarists i know antoine and andy mckee are huge dream theater people and uh <laughs> Uh, Andy, I guess, let it be known publicly that he loved Dream Theater. So they actually got him to open a bunch of shows yep. for them. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, kind of crazy. Awesome. That's so cute. Ryan makes cheese. He's a cheese maker uh, where he lives in the U.S. He says, I could not miss this one. I had to drop the cheese and tune in. <laughs> Dropping the cheese sounds like a strange colloquialism. Uh, <laughs> he was doing really well there for a while. Then he dropped the cheese. I don't know what happened. Yeah. yeah anyway. Uh <laughs> Cool, cool stuff. All right. So, um, oh, here's Alexander says, uh, Alexander actually tunes in every single week and he lives in Siberia. He lives in oh, wow. Novosibirsk. So he, uh, he always has to tune in around midnight his time. At, uh, so poor guy has to stay up so late. But anyway, Alexander <laughs> says, I'd like to ask about creating textures in your compositions. How does he create them? So I guess the, yeah, the overall question is, um, you you create a really large sound palette with your playing like you get not only interesting techniques and things like that but also really dense harmony really and and really really full sounding structures uh to your pieces like they're not um like for example uh, a typical andy mckee approach would be uh bass line and melody line and maybe a little bit of uh middle voice kind of stuff you know andy's very much a, a, a two-line kind of player and it and it, it works really well for his pieces because um they're they're very melodic and so mm -hmm. um yep. uh he tends to rely on the bass line mostly to to just create the underpinnings the harmonic underpinnings of what he wants to create with the melodies whereas your tunes are much much more polyphonic 
and orchestral. Um, so maybe you have a comment about that. Maybe that would help Alexandra understand what yeah, you're doing. Maybe, um, maybe uh, just uh, as an example. Um, Um, yeah, well, just, uh, yeah, the textures, some of it is, uh, of course, I mean, some of it is because of the tuning sometimes I use, I mean, uh, like, like you do also to create different possibilities, but, um, sometimes it could be like in a, sim a more simple song. That's not necessarily a big textural one, but since I'm in the tuning of that, like spiritual groove, it's a very, it's kind of like what you said, there's a bass and the, the melody, but I just want to talk about one thing there. Um, you know, the, the, the main A section, I guess. So this, this example is just the simple uh, one to explain that sometimes when you have, um, you have like the bass, you have the melody, and it, you, you want also to create a different texture in the sound and the tone of each of the parts so they sound more separate. If I play it like, like open bass, just so you notice, I play the bass in the, this version a little more palm muted. But the trebles are long notes. There's some fast things, but they ring, right? There's a lot of open string, a lot of ringing together. So that's one thing I uh, really like to use is to let ring as much as I can. And um, so by doing that on the treble side here on the melody, I like to do a contrasting thing on the bass. Like, like here, it's just a, a bass riff that's kind of staccato and rhythmic and palm muted. So if I do it open, it doesn't have the same impact because the notes in the bass are are open and they sound long like the melody. So they have the same texture. So by palm muting the bass, it sounds like different instruments a little more. So sometimes to create separation, I like to use contrast. Like if my melody is long and ringing, I like bass that are more staccato or the opposite. Or so I'm trying to you know to work with different different textures there already. That's a that's a really great explanation. Yeah, the the, the whole muted bass thing is a fantastic. Um, you create a nice illusion, almost as if almost as if you have an upright bass player playing mm -hmm. with you, um, because you're creating, like you say, uh, a different texture for that sound. And so. Um, they they sound very separate. It's one it's one of the reasons why a lot of people play. Uh, sorry, a lot of people who don't necessarily play fingerstyle, they'll hear somebody like you playing and they'll go, "How many guitarists is that?" And it's not mm -hmm. just that they're commenting on how many notes are going by or how full it sounds. They're they're listening to it and thinking that's not just one instrument, isn't it? That, that, that there's a bass in there or something. Or they, and that was uh, many years ago. I went to this um, uh, evening with Wyndham Hill show. Uh, that the, the, the Wyndham Hill Records people back in the 80s used to do these touring shows. And uh, this one show was the Montreux Band and uh, Philip, Aub Philip Auberg, who was a, a piano player, and Michael Hedges. And so Montreux went first, and, you know, quartet, a lot of fun, jazz kind of stuff. Philip Auberg came out doing all the solo piano stuff. But then he said, I'm going to do one more tune. And then he said, and then we'll have Michael... Bass player? I don't see a bass player anywhere. Hedges. <laughs> so yeah, he'd made made up this big long nickname for Michael. But that was the thing that Michael had going for him too, is that he was able mm -hmm. to create, like you say, a very polyphonic texture just by differentiating the the way that he would play the different notes in the instrument. So that's a great great way of showing yeah. it. Like uh, Ariel Boundaries is a good example. I just have a student that is learning it in college right now, and. Um, He's doing a really good job, and I I pointed out to him how, when by listening again to the, to Michael's um, original track, um, what you can pick up that is, uh, you know, out of the you have a lot of notes. That's a big mud of of rhythms and notes, but in, in within this, he, he is able to outline certain things or to create a pattern with the accenting different notes to make another layer of music. So, for example. Just in standard, just want to show in the. Sometimes it's an exercise I give to my students. It's uh, it's like taken from Villa Lobos, um, Estudo Number no. One, a classical. Uh, but I'm just showing them the pattern, which is a kind of a sk str string skipping pattern. You can repeat that. I mean, it's a whole piece around it. But for now, it's just the, the work of this pattern. And then... 
what we can work on this is different accenting to be able to create different volumes for the different fingers. So if I, for example, I'll play this pattern not too fast, but I, I accent the thumb, I'll hear a certain thing. I hear more. I heard this out of the whole thing. If I do the accenting on the index, it gives you a weird rhythm, but it's going to create a kind of a, a different thing here. So every time that's index playing, you can hear you know, a, a little louder than the other notes. So. I do the same work with middle. I hear down, down, down. And if I do with ring, I hear more the treble string. And then what I can do is uh, maybe if I want to accent the down beats of all this, it would be different fingers, but it would create like a, a stronger volume on, you know, in this pattern. And you hear certain notes more than others. You hear more than just it. You hear that, but along with the rest. Right? If I do the opposite and I, I accent the up strokes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I have the same pattern. Now, now you, you hear more like the treble part out of it. So that, that's just to show that it's this accent thing, and that's why working on these type of exercises is good for uh, being able to add layers to music. So this is all six, eight notes, for example. There's no necessarily not a rhythm there. It's just eight notes. But you could uh, accent different places and create another rhythm with those notes, like So if you if you would write uh, this pattern on a on a on a tablature or something, and then put accent and create another rhythm, you would work and then maybe put the accent on the new rhythm that you want. But even though you're playing eight notes, you're creating a new pattern above it, which has different accent things. So it creates another layer of rhythm. And that's kind of how uh, how I work sometimes to create different different things within things, you know. So it's it creates textures because it adds adds this uh, more complexity and a new rhythm to the same thing. So it, it's it, it's very technical, but at the same time, it's to for a very musical uh, result. Like right, because like because it because it, it creates a uh, really cool um, uh, syncopations and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I heard syncopation being referred to recently really well as a musical surprise, <laughs> and it's true. Like, because what you're taking, like you say, you're taking eighth notes, you know, da 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 da, da really observed as eighth notes, not very interesting. But depending on what you decide to highlight in your in your pattern, all of a sudden you're doing button 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 beating all that kind of stuff. It's really cool and. Um, uh, it's it's a lot like a lot of the work I do with people with uh, with polyrhythm and things like that to try to get them to put together different rhythms in different hands and then using it as a as a finger picking pattern to hear the various um, syncopations. It's really important. That was another question I had for you was about your experience as an educator on the you know sort of like on the official level, like not just a guitar teacher, but you've been. Um, teaching courses at CEGEP. Uh, the CEGEP system in Quebec, for those of you who do not live in Quebec, it's a junior college system. So uh, I went to high school in Quebec, so did Antoine. And um, when I finished high school in Quebec, my family moved to Toronto, so I didn't go to CEGEP. I had to do more high school in Ontario and then go to university, which me off at the time. But anyway, because I was looking forward to going to CEGEP. But... <laughs> Uh, Antoine is an example of somebody who finished high school in Quebec, then went did the junior college thing. Uh, and when you do junior college, you can either take a, a diploma stream where you know you end up with a diploma at the end of it, and that's the extent of your uh, post-secondary education, or you can use it as a pre-university uh, mm -hmm. system. So 
Uh, but I know that you you started up or you were asked to start up a, a fingerstyle guitar course, were you not, at a Sejap in Quebec? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, because that's a students, and uh, I think if I remember well, it's in 2014 that asked uh, for um, it's a college student at Marie Victorin, Montre Mon Montreal, in the east part of Montreal, northeast, mm -hmm. and um, he was he was in classical guitar and he was also in uh, jazz guitar, and but he he said like that's that's not what I want to do is I just I really really want to do finger style guitar and finger picking and stuff, so. Uh, it was lucky enough that because the, the the college had some teachers that were open enough to ask and then you know to work it out to make uh, make it possible to open like this type of of uh, play of uh, of job uh, at the college and audition. So um, I've got like uh, to audition uh, there because of that, and I got I got the the work, you know. And then that's really cool because since I'm still teaching there and I've got like a, you know students since. Um, um, you know, five or six students every semester that are, and that's really cool. They're doing great. There's a, that's a lot of fun because it's, it's the only place you can really get like a, um, a degree in a, in a public school uh, for acoustic guitar. And the only other place there is that I know of is in Wisconsin at the University yeah. of Milwaukee, yeah. John Strope. Yeah, yeah, really. It, like it's, it's so unique. Like, uh, like you say, the John Strope's thing. Um, John Stropes is an educator at the University of, Mil uh, sorry, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And um, back in the 80s, he started a fingerstyle guitar degree program. And I know that it went into hiatus for a little while and then started up again. And um, it's had lots of people go through it over the years. And I went and did a master class and um, a live performance that was actually broadcast on the local uh, national public radio station so that's cool um and he's had a lot of us come through and and do educational things for the students there you have your program at your sejep and then kind of the only other thing is um i taught for one year at dalhousie university in halifax and they have a really great guitar program there and the guy who heads it um is a classical guitarist his name is doug reach and he he said to me he said well um i finished my classical guitar training and then i looked around and i realized how little how little work there was for classical guitarists and mm -hmm. he he was asked to set up a really good um guitar program at dalhousie and he just he told them he said look um unfortunately the only things they ever teach at university the only thing they ever consider the only streams of guitar they ever consider important enough are classical guitar and jazz but there's a whole lot of people not playing either of those styles but they're very serious players and so um it was cool he had me come in i i my touring schedule at the time was too crazy i had to keep subbing out i just couldn't do it uh consistently every week but i really enjoyed it i enjoyed being in back in academia and I taught a lecture course, but then I had a bunch of students teaching them fingerstyle guitar, and uh, there was a real need for it. There was a, a there were a lot of students who wanted to learn. Yep. So that's yep. great that you have that program at um, at the Sejep, and uh, it would be great if eventually there were enough people who uh, sort of lobbied for these programs to happen because it's far and away probably now uh, mm -hmm. aside from maybe you know rock and blues, it's maybe the most popular um form of guitar playing and you know, you look at people like uh, andy and yourself and me and a few other people who have uh, really ridden this wave in the last 20 odd years of uh, mm -hmm. popu popularity and so it's become it's become very uh almost mainstream you know yeah. <laughs> what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true yeah, yeah cool um just looking to see if there are any other comments right now. And uh, creating text, I got that one. Cool. Well, we're we're almost at the one hour mark, and I I, uh, I don't know if there's anything, any last things you want to share with us, any news that's coming up, anything explosive in your life that you want to <laughs> share with yeah, us. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, I've been working a lot on mixing and doing a, a lot of, of producing for other people. I have a lot of people uh, sending me tracks for mixing and mastering, so I've I've been really busy with that, which is great. I can be home and work, and uh, yeah. 
that's kind of a niche that I developed and that's good. I mean, that works. And uh, I have some, you know, returning clients all the time. So now it's building up for years. So I, I got like returning people. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that, I know that uh, before the pandemic, it seemed like every um, mm -hmm. up and coming guitarist I knew was saying, oh yeah, I'm heading to Montreal to record with Antoine, you know? So, <laughs> and that people all over, people all over the States and all this kind of stuff like Spencer Elliott and all those guys. Yep. So. Yep. Uh, that's fantastic for you. That's great. And uh, I know that, you know, it, it, same here, I've been getting uh, kind of cool things happening, not not just with guitarists. I actually just mixed and mastered an entire album for a piano player who put together an album length uh, project for piano, but also, you know, there's violin on it and cello and flute and all these different duets. Uh, so uh, that was a huge undertaking because he had this gigantic number of recordings and I had to assemble them all here and turn them into something that sounded like an album, but it's a lot of fun. I, I really like it. Um, yeah. Well, that this is fantastic. And uh, so I'm sure that everybody uh, really enjoyed the, uh, meeting you and getting to know you better. Uh, Kestine says she hopes that you'll come and tour in Europe sometime soon. Um, maybe, you know, that'll start happening when things get a little safer out there. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure to have you here, Antoine. Thanks so much for doing this.